Welcome. We're so happy to have you all here today, both via Zoom and in the room. Before we get started, let's take a moment to thank yourself for getting here today, for joining, taking the time to join us for a rare and personal conversation with Lily Marks, because you understand the value of learning from others' lived experiences, achievements, failures, and perspectives. Conversations like this one help us think, grow, learn, and change. And we appreciate you taking the time to be here today to learn from Lily's extraordinary life and leadership. Today, we have the pleasure of experiencing a conversation between Matt Winia, the director of the Center for Bioethics and Humanities, and Lily Marks, thanks to the Helen Morris American Jewish Experience in Medicine program. Helen, who is here with us today, is herself a pioneer in medicine and inspired this conversation series. We hope you'll enjoy this conversation so much that you'll want to join us for upcoming conversations, both in this series and for other events at the center, because there is always something new and interesting happening here. A few of the upcoming events include a conversation on red flag laws and the Colorado Clinician, our Fly to Heal mural and Arts as Advocacy exhibit, and Art Therapy for Brain Injured Veterans and First Responders. These in all of our events on our website, and we hope you'll attend and, and invite others to join you as well. Today's conversation will be about 45 to 50 minutes, after which we'll have a bit of time for questions from the audience. And with that, I'm pleased to hand you off to Matt Winia, Director of the Center for Bioethics and Humanities. So I was saying, you know, the 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 neat thing about this program for me as someone who does not uh, come from the Jewish faith tradition um, has been the many ways in which I was the things I've learned that were you know completely unknown to me in the past. We started the program locally last year with a really interesting exploration of how it was that Denver and Colorado became such a mecca for pulmonary diseases. We explored the history of the National Jewish Hospital um, and its role in the forming of Denver and its medical community with Jeannie Abrams, the historian. Uh, we then had an amazing program on anti-Jewish racism in the US and the ways in which racism, anti-Semitism, racism against Jewish people has influenced and reinforced in some ways racism in other communities. Um, we've talked then with uh, Dr. Paul Wolpe about the ways in which um, Jewish bioethics, the religious Jewish bioethics, has had an influence on what you might call sort of mainstream bioethics, uh, many ways in which Jewish bioethics has sort of permeated the ways that we think about ethical issues in healthcare. And then just a couple of months ago, we had a remarkable program with the historian Bob Baker talking about Jewish whistleblowers in America and in a, a program that he called uh, Nuremberg Memories about the ways in which Jewish memories of the Nuremberg trials influenced subsequent um, behaviors when they came upon um, research ethics abuses in the US. All of these, by the way, are on our website. If any of those topics sound interesting, you can listen to those programs. Uh, the website is coloradobioethics.org. Uh, this year, uh, we are embarking on a new uh, mini series, if you will. Uh, We're going to do a series of conversations where we learn from and about prominent Jewish women in American medicine. Um, and we're gonna start as we did last year with uh, a local story. Um, we're gonna start with uh, someone I think is fair to characterize as a celebrity in Denver uh, medicine. Um, and uh, I, I say that uh, because I think many of you uh, in this audience, many people online will know or recognize Lily Marks. Lily served for a decade as the vice president for health affairs for our university and the Anschutz Medical Campus on which we sit today and, the create, and in the creation of which she played a very important set of roles. Before her service as the vice president for the university, she was the CEO for the University of Colorado Medicine back when it was called UPI. 
Uh, she was also the Senior Associate Dean for Finance and Administration in our School of Medicine, and she served on the board of Children's Hospital of Colorado. She was awarded uh, by the Regents of the University of Colorado the uh, University Medal for her role, what they called transformational uh, contributions to the university. And she's, of course, received many other awards locally and nationally. Um, I'll just mention that she has been one of Denver's outstanding women in business and one of the 25 most powerful women in Colorado. And for those of you not in Colorado, you might recognize her for her service on the board of directors of the Federal Reserve Bank as chair of the board for the Association of American Medical Colleges, the AAMC, with which all of us in the medical community are very familiar. And some of you might even know uh, that she was on uh, Senator Ted Kennedy's advisory committee on health care reform prior to the election uh, in which Barack Obama was elected president. And her work with Senator Kennedy ended up in part becoming incorporated into the Affordable Care Act. So she has been influential both locally as well as nationally and also uh, we'll probably end up talking about internationally. Um, and I will say. I've now talked to four prominent Jewish women in American medicine about whether they would be willing to do this program with us. And I think it's fair to say a key characteristic of prominent Jewish women in American medicine is that they are a little too humble and a little too shy. And we had to cajole um, Lily into being willing to get this kind of treatment today. Um, and you will all be very happy that we did because I've now spent a couple hours on the phone with Lily and I'll tell you, um, this is going to be a really interesting conversation. So welcome and thank you for being willing to do this, uh, Lily Marks. Um, I'm going to start way back. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to start way back. Could tell us about your childhood. Where, where did you grow up? Who were the sort of important people in your life? Uh, you know, we all sort of have these memories from childhood that stick with us through our whole lives. And I, I'd love to hear what what your what the environment was like. What what environment creates a, a leader like you? And what are the pieces of your childhood that have stuck with you? If yours is on, if it's not, we can do this. Is this working? Does it work? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much. And Dr. Morris, I am just honored to be here. Uh, and we had some interesting conversations out in the lobby. I, I think um, one thing people might not know about me is actually I was not born in the United States. But as I was saying, my uh, parents were Holocaust survivors. My father was in Alabama. Mother was in Bergen Belsen. Uh, we uh, and they were in a in a refugee camp for four years, waiting for a visa to the United States. And I was born there, and I came here when I was about a year old. And we settled on the west side of Denver, on uh, just south of West Colfax. And um, I have some very dear friends here from my West Side girls. <laughs> um, I had a really happy childhood. You know, I. Um, we, uh, my parents came here, they had no money, no language skills, um, very little education. They had, both of them just had an eighth grade ed education because. So, uh, you know, we lived a pretty frugal life actually. And, and as they were trying to get established in this country, but I, about my, my childhood, it was wonderful. It was, I, our, I was loved. I was safe, I was secure, I lived in a peaceful home. Um, uh, and uh, I had wonderful friends. Uh, and we actually have a group of about 10 of us that have remained friends for seven decades and we still get together occasionally. Um, so the West Side experience was I think a very special one. I'm gonna... I'm sure. I am sorry. All right. So I won't, I won't repeat myself. <laughs> Some people just have to catch up, but um, we'll, uh, but my memories really are, are good ones overall. And I think the West side experience, it really 
personified the concept of it takes a village. And I grew up in that village. I was going to ask, um, it, you know, with parents who went to eighth grade and didn't have language skills, you obviously became very accomplished in school. You must have done well in school. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how, how did that work? Uh, who helped you with your homework? Um, was that, you know, siblings? Did you have other people around? Uh, I want to hear more about the village. So I, I have a brother, but he was six years younger. So I, 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 I can say with certainty he didn't help me with my schoolwork. <laughs> I'm not sure I helped him either. But, uh, um, but uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I think my parents always really regretted and I was aware of is that they weren't able to help me with my schoolwork. I had to kind of figure it out on my own. Um, on the other hand, um, it, in their own way, I, I think they really, one, my father always used to say, you know, life can take a lot of things away from you your health, your money, it can never take away your education. And so I did grow up in an environment that there was always the expectation of, of performance. Um, one memory I, I have, I shared this with Matt earlier. Uh, when I was about nine years old, one day my father sat me down at the table and he handed me a stack of envelopes that were all bills, household bills, and he gave me his checkbook. And he said, um, all right, we're going to you're going to write the checks and keep the, you know, the balance, the, the checkbook, and he would check it. And I think what he was really doing is in his own way, trying to help me with math, you know, and it really wasn't about helping me write his checks. And we did this every couple of weeks. And I think whether it was intentional or not, um, what he taught me in that process is he taught me about a little bit about money and how money works and how banks work a little bit of how business works. And, uh, a year or two later, after working hard and saving a lot of money or money, um, he bought his first piece of real estate and he allowed, it was a six unit apartment house and he allowed me to tag along with him. Many times I must've been 10 or 11 years old and he would kind of explain, you know, what it was doing. And, and um, I realized that even though they weren't helping me with my, you know, algebra or calculus or even mm -hmm. literature, you know, or, uh, they had limited language skills at the time. Uh, my father exposed me to something at a very early age that um, many women in that generation never experienced because finance and business was the man's world. And he allowed his little girl to come along with him. And I actually, that's where I actually developed my interest in and confidence in. Um, did your parents talk to you about their experiences during the war? Or, or maybe I should ask, when did your parents start talking to you? When were they willing to talk to you? I've uh, just in talking with other second generation folks, it seems like a pretty common story that they're a little reticent to to share. Uh, so they they spoke very little to my brother and I. I think in part, you know, to spare us from the, the horror of it, but. You know, they talked about it, but just the the general details. You know, we knew they had a tattooed number on their arm. They we we knew the basic outlines. Um, because I spoke Yiddish, because my grandmother lived with us and she only spoke Yiddish. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there was a lot I just kind of heard. You know, yeah. uh, that that I wasn't part of the conversation, but I heard or from their parents. But when I was growing up, I didn't know. We knew the what, the when, the why, but not a real deep understanding. Um, I did know that my parents had another child before the war who was killed by the Nazis when they went to the camps. Um, and um, it wasn't really until much later. Um, really, it was after my mother died and I spent a lot of time with my father where I really got into some really deep and profound conversations about not just what happened, but about survival and what lessons, you know, he learned and could impart, which were profound. And they really had a big impact on my life. <laughs> yeah, say more. What, what were the... Um, well, first, I should say one, one thing that I was really blessed about. I mean, you know, there are a lot of things my parents couldn't do for me, but I was very blessed that both of them um, not that many people survived, as many of you know, the Holocaust. And many of them who survived physically had lifelong scars and difficulties. And 
my blessing was both of my parents, and some people here know my parents, um, both of them survived not just physically, but emotionally and mentally intact. And they were some of the most positive, life-affirming um, people in the world. They were generous. They were um, kind. Uh, they had the ability to forgive. And they just loved life. Every life, every every day, every minute, you know, was was a blessing. And I they imparted that um, to me. Uh, but as I got older, you know, I, I really got interested and I had a lot of conversations about my father about survival. I got really interested in how did you survive? You know, how did people in similar circumstances, some survived and some didn't? Um, and were there are there intrinsic characteristics of individuals that help them survive difficulties? And so I'll I'll take a minute. I, this is yeah. a uh, there were two lessons that I think you know impacted me and I think have relevance to anyone. Um, one of the things my father told me is he said you know Lily to survive um, to survive a war or a holocaust or life. Um, you can never think of yourself as a victim. You know, to to survive, you have to, when you believe you're a victim, what happens is you believe your fate is in the hands of somebody else, that you have no control over the outcome, that there's nothing you can do to alleviate alleviate your pain or impact your outcome. And And what happens is that little by little, then you stop interfacing with your challenge. And he said to survive meant every day. I mean, you weren't, you didn't have the luxury of a bad day or a weak moment. You had to get up and push yourself and have an iron will. Uh, it was, it was easier to give up and die than to survive another day. And he said to me, I, I, I was convinced, I was determined I was not going to be Hitler's victim. And he said, um, to survive many of life's challenges. You can't think of yourself as a victim, that somebody else is in control, um, because then you stop interfacing with your challenge. And he said, that's what Hitler relied on. He said, that's what despots, even bullies in the world, rely, rely on making you feel hopeless and helpless and powerless so that they can control you. And I thought that was just a profound, um, to me, it was a um, lesson in life. And, and we actually explored the difference between victimization and victimhood. Um, you know, all of us at, in, in your life at some time, you, you're a victim or you're victimized, but that's something external that happens to you. Victimhood is internal. It's something you put on yourself. And he said, you can't wrap yourself in victimhood. And he said, God forbid you should ever have a war or a Holocaust in your life. But he said, life's going to knock you around plenty. You know, and anybody that's blessed to live long enough is going to face challenges they didn't choose for themselves, whether it's with their their family, their marriage, their kids, their job, their health. And he said, what defines you is not what befalls you. What defines you is how you respond. Mm -hmm. So um, that was one lesson. And, and the second one I, I think is worth sharing is um, the importance of forgiveness. He said, there are things that happen to you that you can never forget and probably should never forget. But at some point, you have to learn how to forgive so that you can get rid of the, bit, the toxic bitterness and anger that, um, that can really change your life. And I, I really think that my parents' ability to forgive, recognizing that didn't um, that wasn't a betrayal of what happened to them, or the, uh, mm -hmm. but that the ability to forgive is really what allowed them to then find joy again, and um, to you know have a choice of living to avenge the past or enhance the present and the future. But I think my parents were remarkable in those two regards. Uh, as you undoubtedly know, a very contentious era issue within the survivor community, the idea of forgiveness and who are you forgiving and what are you forgiving for and for whom are you? Uh, did you have that conversation with your father about, I don't know if, uh, you know, the, so Ava Kaur was a, a well-known twin experiment victim uh, of, of Mengele who, uh, featured in a film called Forgiving Mangala. Um, and she became almost an outcast within that community because of her insistence that she had forgiven him. 
uh, and others said you, you should not. And I, I'm just curious if you had ever had that conversation with your father. Uh, not that directly. I will say that uh, my mother uh, had a hard time not, not forgiving the Germans or the Poles, but she had a hard time um, overcoming the fact that her childhood friends or neighbors would turn you in for five pounds of sugar, you know? And, and so I think, you know, we never really talked about, you know, globally forgiveness or, for, but, and maybe you can't forgive the, in, the specific individual, but can you forgive the country, the people that weren't, you know, that were there, but you have to, it, they did have to forgive. And, and, and they said, it's not a betrayal of what happened to you. It's not a denial of the horror of what happened to you, but you've got to move forward in your own life. And you can't, if you have that toxic. But my mother would never go back. We took it. We did a family roots trip back to Poland. And by then she was very ill and she didn't come, but she never wanted to go back. We had to convince my dad, but um, it was an incredible trip. Um, so I'm going to call on our earlier conversation because you told me a little bit about your uh, your father and your uncle's experience at Auschwitz and Birkenau. Um, and I think it'd be worth telling that story uh, in part because we're in a medical environment here. We have a program around the legacy of health care and health professionals in the Holocaust. Um, and I'd love to hear a little more about what your your father and your uncle's experiences were in terms of the their interactions um, with medical professionals in the camps. Uh, well, one thing I knew about just in the broad strokes, but never, we re really never talked about, it was kind of forbidden territory, is that, you know, in the camps in Auschwitz, I think your life was dependent on whether they could use you for something, you know, uh, and uh, everybody was kind of assigned to work. And my father um, actually worked in Mangala's hospital, um, mostly cleaning up. I mean, he wasn't participant in it, you know, to mm -hmm. clean up the, we never really talked about that. We really never did. And um, um, did it impact him? You know, I remember as a child, my parents, both my parents at sometimes at night waking up and screaming and a nightmare or whatever, but um, uh, we never, we never, um, what was sad with both of my parents, my mother passed away from Alzheimer's. And I remember, you know, as you lose your early memories, your let your older ones remain. And there was a point in that process where what she was remembering was horrible. And uh, at the end of my father's life, he was here in the ICU for a few weeks and he had, you know, some of the ICU psychosis. And I think that fear came Although he got his care from one of our geriatricians here, who is one of my heroes, I won't name him, but um, uh, he used to invite my father to come meet with the students and residents. My dad lived till 98, and at 97, he was still going to the health club by himself and every day and driving himself. He was a remarkable man, and our geriatrician wanted other students to realize life does not end at 60 <laughs> or 65. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, your productive life. Uh, but I, I do want to, uh, uh, you asked me about my uh, uncle, hey, uncle, Aaron, who I never met. My father had eight siblings and only he and one sister survived. His parents, his grandparents, aunts, uncles, nieces, everybody was gone. But um, when he got to Auschwitz, his brother, Aaron, who was his younger brother, was there. And somehow they did connect twice while he was there. And the last time he saw him, um, Aaron said to my father, um, tomorrow there's going to be an uprising and I'm part of it and I probably won't survive it, but I want you to know that. Um, I want you to steer clear of it. Um, and I want you to keep your head down because if they connect you with me, you know, that's not a good thing. Uh, my uncle Aaron was uh, part of one of the, I think, few acts of true resistance in the camps. He and a small group of men found a way to smuggle explosives into Auschwitz and they blew up one of the crematoria and damaged one. 
And, um, and so I think, um, you know, they were caught very quickly. Their escape plan didn't work and he was, he was killed that day or the next day. But um, I think it was credited with saving probably thousands of lives. It didn't stop the war the machinery, but it, it slowed it down. Mm -hmm. um, I guess two questions, but they're kind of related, which are around. Um, it's fascinating to me that uh, anyone coming out of the Holocaust and knowing, you know, the uh history there and Mengele and so on would then want to spend their life um creating a healthcare system <laughs> and and yet here you are so do you think that did that history um play a role in how your career evolved how how did you end up in healthcare and in you know an academic medical center campus I never even thought about that connection in the whole Thing. And no, it didn't lead me to it or keep me from it. Um, I, Fair but enough to say, um, other than, you know, in my own life, I've, I've become a believer that, you know, one of the basic things we're all entitled to is healthcare or should be and have access to. Um, I never, I really never intended to go into medicine or into academic medicine. I didn't even know what it was. Um, my background and I, and so my career has been kind of an anomaly in, in academic medicine. Um, I'm neither a physician or a scientist. I, uh, my background is in finance. And when I finished business school, my first, um, my first job was as a financial analyst for Standard and Poor's. And then from there, I went on to work for a large banking system um, in the trust department, managing um, investment portfolios in the trust department. And then I'd been kind of promoted. I was being moved into investment banking. And I really thought that's where my career was going to be. I enjoyed it. I was good at it. I loved finance. I loved business. And I thought that I was going to have a career in investment banking. And then my husband decided he wanted to go to law school. And um, we agreed. Um, he got into CU and DU, but we agreed that um, if he could get into a top five or a top 10 school, that's where we would go. And he got into a couple and we ended up in Charlottesville, Virginia at the University of Virginia, which is a great law school. Um, Back and my daughter went there also, but um, uh, uh, when we were there, this we got there in 1973. It was a tiny little hamlet. It was a beautiful little college town. There was no financial infrastructure, and I was so certain it would be no problem. I had you know good experience, references. I thought I'd get a job, and I couldn't find a job that was equivalent to the one I had. And rent was due, and tuition was due, due and we were starting to panic. And I. Um, the best job I could find was as a division business manager in the School of Medicine. And uh, it was a giant U-turn for me in terms of the level of responsibility and what I had been doing. And I really struggled with it, actually, for about four, five, six months. And um, what happened was it was really, a, a, it was kind of an inflection point in medicine. I, it was right when the business of medicine was just starting. It was a few, yeah, well, it was a few years after Medicare and Medicaid was established and medical schools had this aha moment that, that they, they could actually monetize their clinical practice. And so th things were really changing in medicine. And I, and, um, I found, and it was recognized by others, that I had a unique skill set at a unique time, you know, in terms of, of the business of medicine. And so I, I, you know, my responsibilities started to slowly increase there. And then when we left Charlottesville and came to Denver, uh, I could have easily gone back into bag banking. But over that three-year period, I really it, I, I found a love and a real passion for the missions of academic medicine, for the public goods of research, medical research and science, discovery, education, healthcare, you know, at the leading edge really became something I was passionate about. And I decided I would rather do that with my skills rather than make individuals wealthy, including myself. I could have done better the other, had I gone the other path. But um, I really developed a passion for it. And when we moved back to, to Denver, um, I started working here um, at, the, at the university, at the medical school. My first job, and I see one of our former chairs here, uh, my first job was uh, uh, as the uh, business manager for the Department of Medicine. Um, I was the first hire of the chair at the time. You know him well, uh, or knew him well. Um, and um, really, I, I, I was really fortunate. I, you know, each of my positions, um, I had the opportunity I, somehow to evade being kind of pigeonholed as the 
the, the finance person in the back room. I was allowed to not only apply my financial skills, but combine them with the missions and to sit at the table as other important you know, issues were being discussed. And I think that just enhanced the value I had of being able to, to translate my unique skills to a totally different environment and try to help it. Are there, so I, I loved hearing the, the almost accidental path into medicine. Are there, um, are there decisions you made in the, at that time of your life that you look back on now and say, I would have done that differently? Or, or I guess conversely, are there things you, decisions you made at the time that you were not sure of, and now you look back and say, that was the wisest thing I, I've done? Well, sometimes you're just forced to make a decision. It's like when we went, you know, to Charlottesville or decided to go uh, to go down that path. You know, you come to a fork in your in the road, and you got to take it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, <laughs> and you know, I, I, yeah. And I remember telling my children, and they all the angst about which college should I go to, you know. And you know, my view is you're blessed to have good decisions, um, and it's up to you to make them the right one. You know, so uh, whatever you pick, uh, make, it right. make it the right decision. And, you know, and, and I, 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 you know, it wasn't all me. I was very fortunate. You know, I, I kind of landed in places and uh, was able to work with people that actually gave me a lot of opportunity. You know, I think I worked hard to get it. But 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 I I, I also was very strategic in, in decisions I made about who I wanted to work for and what that environment was. But um, uh I forgot your original question. Oh, it was about, oh, about decision regret yeah. or or gratitude. No, it, uh, no, no regrets. Um, one thing I found as a woman, um, I had some opportunities that came along earlier on in my career that I chose not to take because I, my children were just too young. You know, so sometimes you, with regret, say no, but it doesn't really close the door. You know, they come back and when the time is right, it's actually a better decision. So. Um, uh, one of the things that when I was working actually in the department of medicine, I was, um, my daughter was three weeks old. I was on maternity leave and the chair of the department called me and said, we need you to, they, they, they were struggling with creating an incentive plan or a, a practice plan, a faculty practice plan. And it wasn't going anywhere. He said, you need to write a draft. I didn't even know what a practice plan was. I spent my 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 uh, maternity leave figuring it out and writing a draft, which actually 90% of what was in that original draft, which created UPI, is still functioning um, today. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I was, you know, encouraged to think about taking over the leadership of, of UPI then at the beginning. And again, my, my kids were too young and I didn't do it. I wanted to do it, but I didn't. But then um, 10 years later, um, I ended up associate dean and there was a crisis in the practice plan and they let go of the ceo and they had a failed national search and they said kind of twisted my arm said we don't have anybody else will you do it for one year and i did it you know i did both for one year and then 20 years later i was still doing it <laughs> doing both but it was a great it was great i what what advice um would you give your you know 25 or 30 year old self today if you if you look back and say oh i wish i had known then you know i don't um i don't look back a lot i mm -hmm. you know i don't i don't kind of look at why for decisions with regret you know i i i feel very fortunate i mean things worked out i worked hard but you know, I think I helped him work out, but I, I'm not sure, you know, I, I can't, I can't look back with any regrets. I think I've had a great life, a great career. I did more than I ever expected. Um, honestly, every single day of every single day, I feel honored to have been here and have had the opportunity to, to work here and to try to make a difference and make an impact. So no, I, I, I don't, I, you know, the only advice, we talked a little bit about this. I'm going to kind yeah. of veer back into this. But um, one of the things I, I do think, um, 
as I've kind of reevaluated my life, I, I realized that I think I, I have suffered from some survivor's guilt. Um, not because my parents ever made me feel that way or, or, or used that guilt to influence how I performed or whatever, but it wasn't lost on me that how much of my family was wiped out and a sister. And I always felt this internal, and not from my parents, internal pressure that you had to live for them and accomplish for them and achieve for them. And I've, I've thought a lot about how that's impacted my own personality. And, um, you know, if I'm totally honest, it, in good ways and also in some that are not so good. And what would I change? Um, I'm pretty intense. I'm pretty driven. And uh, my engine's always revving. And um, and that's hard on people. I mean, it's it's it takes up a lot of space in the room. And, um, you know, it. Um, I don't know how to have fun. I, mm. I have fun. I've had fun in my life. But I don't, you know, I'm not fun happy you know i'm happy but i'm i'm not fun <laughs> <laughs> i i i i wanted to probe that a little bit because i know how much work you have done on sort of helping emerging women leaders in particular but i would say emerging leaders in general that you've given a lot of thought um to how to support and foster and help move along people who show great promise and i and, uh, you know, what advice do you think you give them that is derived from your own experience, you know, not from a book or uh, from something you learned um, in a text or in your, you know, finance um, sort of, not the numbers, but the, the, the realities of leadership and taking on leadership, um, which you obviously, it happened to you because of something, right? You got the yeah. you got these offers because of something. Well, oh gosh, that's a big question. <laughs> There's yeah. a lot of parts to it. Um, the uh, well, first of all, I I feel very fortunate in as I said in my career, and you know, I feel that in life and in my career. I stood taller because people let me stand on their shoulders. You know, I didn't ever have a formal mentor, but I had, you know, a lot of people that helped me and I feel a real obligation. I really do that, that you have to help the next people. Um, I, uh, with respect to, to helping women, um, that's been a real, uh, a real focus of mine, especially now in this po point of my career. Um, you know, when I started, um, in medicine, I was usually the only person in the room, woman in the room, not person in the room, the only woman in the room. Um, and it, it was hard, you know, in the seventies, we were kind of at the front end of women in professional development. Um, I think a lot of the structural biases that, that women back then faced are now gone. Um, you know, uh, women are equal in, in med schools, law school populations, in the entry level jobs, it gets more difficult, you know, the gender issues as you move mm -hmm. further up. But, um, but even then, you know, I found that it is what it is. It's the environment you've found yourself in and you've chosen to be in, you got to figure it out. And, um, and the problem is, I think, for women, you know, how do they navigate that? And, and I, I, I for me, I just I was never kind of in the women's lib movement or kind of at the front end of the the militant, you know, gender stuff. Uh, but it was really when I started seeing my two daughters. I have two daughters, and both of them have very successful careers now um, and small children, and so they're navigating it, all of this. And I realized that as much as things have changed since I started, a whole hell of a lot hasn't changed, and um, for women. And so that's when I've. I've really gotten involved in a lot of programs, um, uh, uh, both mentoring and I'm, I'm active in the ELAM program, which some of you know about, and some of the professional development courses that other universities um, do that I lecture in regularly and, and are part of the AAMC. I want to ask one more question that's derived from our earlier conversation, and then we'll turn to the audience to see if there are questions um, from others. Um, could you say a word about um, the perception of leadership as being uh, 
in a position of power or control. Well, you know, and it kind of converges with the question you asked me, and I, yeah. I'd forgotten to, uh, to to get to. But um, you know, leadership is something that uh, that uh, I think there are a lot of characteristics of of strong leaders that um, it's first of all the power resides in the position; it doesn't reside in you um, as an individual. And the the trick is how you use your power. Uh, I, I I really believe that um, that in the concept of of servant leaders, and that you're there for the good of the institution. That leadership is about not just the title and the influence; it's it's about how you meet the needs of the group that you're serving and how you lead them. Um, it, somebody once said, you know. Here's here's a glass. Of, I, they came into my office and and as a mentor, and I had a glass of water in my desk, and he said, "Put your finger in the glass of water. What happens? The level of the water rises. Um, take your you know just from displacement. Now take your finger out. Where's the hole? And it's an important reminder about leadership. You know, you can make a difference. You can raise the tide, rise the tide, whatever. Um, but but. You have to understand your your temporal your limitations. You know the the humility of um, what you can do and what you can impact, um, um, and that where you really make an impact is, I think, with your family, the people who love you, and uh, that's that's where there's a hole if you leave. Hopefully, um, but there are a lot of important characteristics of leadership. You know, and and the fact that if you want the title and you want the power, you better use it. And you better lead. And I think one of the problems we have is a lot of leaders that have the title and the seat at the table, but they don't lead. They, you know, leadership's hard. It's hard. It's problems. It's hard discussions. It's hard decisions. It's messy. And you've got to be willing to do that. Um, and, and that's what you're there for. And you've got to be willing to um, use whatever political capital you have, whatever courage and talents you have to actually try to lead, to make a difference and to get people to follow you, you know, to have a vision. And it can't, that vision can't only be at a hundred thousand feet, you know, that strategy. If you can't land the plane, you've accomplished nothing, you know? So it's, it's, it's vision, it's strategy, it's leadership, but it's also execution and the getting your hands dirty, you know, making it happen. I'm rambling now. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll turn to the audience now and see if there are any questions from folks in the audience. If there are not, I have more, but uh, I don't want to hog up. We've got 10 minutes left. Are there, is there anything in the chat? Okay. Can you use the microphone in front of you? Just push the button and hold it down. There you go. You have to keep, you have to keep holding it down. No, <laughs> we've known each other for a long time. Like to have you comment on when you're confronted in a male world with battling factions of males and you are a female who can in fact and did in my opinion manage the conflict and bring the outcome to a much better resolution how does a woman work in that environment is there a um, you know some kind of a wonderful formula you can give or or what it's not easy i mean it is hard and it, and it it's it's getting easier but there's still a lot of implicit bias unconscious bias it's hard sometimes for women to make their voice heard um uh, one thing is um, you have to raise your hand. You have to exercise your voice. You know, I think a lot of women often tend to mute themselves because it's it's not a, a friendly environment, you know, a receptive environment. Um, 
one thing I did learn is uh, to make your voice heard, you better know what you're talking about. And um, one thing I always learned is I wasn't going to be the smartest person in the room, but I was always going to be the most well-prepared person in the room. And, and I was willing to, to talk, <laughs> speak, you, you know me, I mean, I, I, I'm not shy about expressing an opinion, but I usually try to have it be an informed opinion. And I think over time, when you do that, you know, not everybody's going to be receptive, but people do listen and they do come along. Um, but it is hard. And women, you know, there's a whole thing with women about the imposter syndrome and, and how you overcome this belief that you're not worthy or you're not equal to the task and, and how you overcome that, you know, to, to as a woman, try to make an impact. Um, so it, it was a lot harder than I hope I made it look, but it was, it was difficult. And, um, uh, but I, um, uh, you know, I'm proud that a lot of times, and it was some of your colleagues every now and then, after a meeting would say, thank you for saying something all of us were thinking, <laughs> <laughs> but wouldn't say. <laughs> and so part of it is you just got to, you know, if, you, if, if it's something you care about, you just got to put it, put yourself out there. And I, that's one of the reasons I do spend a lot of time with women, and you know, trying to coach professional development, do a lot of leadership programs for men and women both about how do, you, how do you use your voice? How do you use your skills to lead? Ed. This is a question from online. What are your thoughts? On, oops, sorry, it just rolled on me. What are your thoughts on how to balance sustainability and growth, business-driven, with healthcare focus on healing, well-being? Where do you see the challenge? How do you retain how do we retain our how do we retain our compassion and care in the face of financial pressure in the healthcare setting? That's an easy question. <laughs> uh, well, you know, there's um there's an interesting uh balance, you know, in healthcare uh between One of the parents, margin and mission, you know, and without margin, there is no vision. Um, without money, there is no mission. Um, you know, and, and, and it's one of the paradoxes, really, of, of, of leadership, of healthcare, of life. Um, how do you manage the difference between principle spelled PLE um, versus principle spelled PAL? You know, the PLE definition is a, a value of a society, an institution. Uh, profession, PAL is the financial definition. And healthcare clearly is caught up in that intersection, you know, at the crossroads between mission and money. And um, it, it's become a big industry. What's one of the big changes in my career is it turned from what was largely a not for profit enterprise to a big for profit industry. And um, so there's a lot of conflicts about that, you know, and how do you do the right thing? Um, how do you how do you mix the need for money and the presence of money with with how you deliver healthcare? There's a, and again, this is a big deep question, and all the issues in our country relative to what we know um, is the major driver of disease and illness, which are this this um, the social determinants of health, which this country doesn't invest in, you know, and so some of the stuff on the front end that would actually alleviate um, some of the suffering and, and problems and actually leads to better health outcomes, better, uh, haven't solved that as a, pro as a country. And even you know, on our campus, I know there's a lot of work that's done in that area, um, but uh, the whole issue of population health, value-based medicine, you know, where you put your dollars to have the greatest impact, there's a lot of discussion about that, but we've been discussing it for decades now, and there hasn't been as much impact on it. And that kind of drives into, I believe, what is the, the issue and presence role of the free market in healthcare? There are many advantages of it, but um, the cost of healthcare, the access to healthcare, the issues in healthcare are dramatically um, impacted by the role of the free market in ways that no other country, developed country, um, has or would, would tolerate. 
And we have, to, I mean, there are solutions, but I think often that gets in the way of the solutions. I, I, it's not a good answer to the question because it's it's such a, a big question. And we have, there are solutions. I really do believe there are, but as a country, I don't think we've gotten it so polarized and politicized, monetized that I don't, and we don't have enough time to talk about what some of them are. <laughs> I'm going to go back to a question that Boris, Dr. Tabakoff asked a moment ago, because I think you were driving at something else about some of the tensions that exist sometimes in a place um, and in our place. And we are both survivors of some of that. Um, but one of the things I did find um, and I do believe in is that leadership has to be transparent. It has to be transparent with information. Um, and it has to be, um, if you, my experience is working with faculty, um, if you give them good information, it's accurate, it's consistent, it's reliable, it's understandable, it's relevant. If you help discuss and frame the issue and have the right discussion, they will always make the right decision. Uh, being mad. It's be it man or woman in that situation, your skill was the ability to impart information that was relevant and basically uh, to the point. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I hope uh, in answer to your question, the knowledge that is needed to become a to be a leader is important. I you. That's all. That's Thanks so much for sharing with us today. It's been great. In your work with um, Senator Kennedy on what became the Affordable Care Act, um, what what changes would you like to make to it today that were not incorporated when it became law? Yeah. Well, so uh, my work there, he, uh, at the time, Senator Kennedy was uh, the chair of uh, the health committee, health education, labor and pensions in the Senate. And, and he was the one that was, I think, expected to take health care reform through Congress, you know, especially if a Democrat won and Obama did win. And so he put together a little committee of about seven of seven people. And as has often been the case in my career, I was the only non-physician in the group and thinking, what, you know, what am I doing here? Uh, but uh, we explored many things. You know, part of it was the social determinants of health, population health, um, Medicaid expansion, um, um, evidence-based medicine, you know, all the kind of major things. But a big part of that, and the one thing that I probably is a, a set of knowledge and skill that I had running, having run um, the practice plan here, university physicians and CU Medicine for so long, was really about how healthcare, the economics of healthcare and how it's reimbursed. And one of the things I learned in the years here of dealing with Medicare, Medicaid, the commercial insurance companies, the issues of um, pre existing conditions, um, rescission of coverage. Um, medical uh, lifetime caps, medical loss ratios. Those were things that the other committee members didn't really understand. And I did well, you know, those are the battles I fought every day. And so I drafted that part of the white paper. Yeah. Um, and then um, when uh, Kennedy, as you know, became very ill at the end and um, when the, the work actually, the, his, the liaison to that committee was Dr. Kavita Patel. Um, who is, uh, some of you may have seen her on MSNBC. She's at the Brookings now and at, at Johns Hopkins. But she, she, we worked very closely together. And when she, uh, when he got sick, she actually ended up in the West Wing with Obama and part of the drafting of the Affordable Care Act. And so she used to call me frequently because they actually built that piece of it based on that original chapter on um, reimbursement. Uh, so the the one thing that I think was sad that I think died in the bill, and I don't want to get political, I have some thoughts about how that whole process went, but the whole evidence-based care piece of it kind of got 
um, mutated into the granny death panels. And I don't know if some of you are nodding. I kind of remember that. And I think that was a tremendous loss. There were some other things that I think could have been done better. I think the the penalties for not having care were too small, um, you know, to, um, but, but overall, I think it was a massive step forward. And if you really look at it, I think it, the benefits to this country have been huge in terms of increasing the access to healthcare, Medicare expansion, the marketplace is allowing people to buy care, um, uh, I mean, it, it could have been a lot better had it not gotten caught in that political, you know, divisiveness. Uh, but it, and it still can get better. It needs to. And even with it, you know, we still don't have the right access to care, the cost of care. We, the richest country in the world, have created in health, a health care system that even we can't afford. Um, and that's a big problem. And I learned, I really learned about that sitting on the Federal Reserve. and it's got to be addressed. That will be the topic of our next conversation. <laughs> I want to thank you all for joining us today and apologies. We ran over just a couple minutes, but it was a fascinating conversation and I really appreciate you all being here. Let's thank Lily once more. <laughs>